Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another installment of Unit 2 Classification. Today, what we're going to be talking about is viruses and bacteria. Now, bacteria, we know, falls under the prokaryotic domains of bacteria and archaebacteria. However, viruses are something completely different. Viruses aren't actually in any kingdom of their own. They're a very unique set of organisms that aren't technically alive. So what we're going to be doing today is discussing viruses and then moving into the bacteria. So as we follow along, we'll be learning a little bit of background, some examples of each, how they reproduce, etc. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get this show on the road, shall we? So viruses, like we said before, viruses are not in the six kingdoms. So the big question that's being debated is, are they living or non-living? They do contain genetic material in the form of DNA and RNA. However, they lack organelles. And also, they cannot reproduce unless they're inside of a host cell. So based on that, what do you think? Are they living or non-living? Think back to Go Racer. Well, that's for you to decide. Got to keep in mind, I can't actually hear you, so I'm going to go ahead and let you think about that one on your, on your own. But let's just talk about viruses for a bit more here. The word virus comes from the Greek word for poison, which makes a lot of sense considering most viruses are nothing but poison for the body. Considering they can go ahead and cause a wide variety of different diseases and illnesses. So some more info about viruses. Viruses are much smaller than bacterial cells. So what we have here is your normal bacteria, which if you go ahead and take a look at the little chart down here, bacteria can be found right here. Now bacteria is about one micrometer. So just for a heads up, micro is about point zero 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 one meters so that is one micrometer now most viruses however do this one in red viruses are around the nanometer and a nanometer is about point zero 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 one two three four five six seven zero one meter. So as you can see these things are incredibly tiny and can only be seen with an electron microscope, which is a very high powered, unique microscope. Now, scientists have only recently, and when I say recently, we're talking in the last 60 years, learned anything about viruses. Before that, we had no idea what was going on. And they classified them according to what type of cells they attack. So whether or not they attack blood cells, bacteria cells, skin cells, whatever they attacked, that's what they went ahead and classified them by. So, let's... Think about this for a second. We're not actually going to talk this over because, like I said before, I'm just a recording. Sorry to break the illusion here. So the question is, what diseases are you familiar with that are caused by viruses? Hmm? Just some examples that I can think of, uh, think of off the top of my head. We've got the common cold. We've got a wide variety of STDs, or STIs, I think that's what they're calling them now, but anyway, there are a huge amount that go ahead and cause huge disorders, including the HIV virus, also known as AIDS. So in your experience or knowledge, are these diseases easy or difficult to treat? Well, depending on which one you came up with, that's going to influence your answer, but for the most part, viruses are incredibly hard to kill and most of the time you just have to let them run their course. 
So viral diseases. Some examples include AIDS or HIV, measles, hepatitis, chickenpox, smallpox, influenza, H1N1, also known as the swine flu, and the common cold, also known as the rhinovirus. No, it has nothing to do with, you know, your typical, like, <laughs> rhino. Also, West Nile, which was a huge thing that commonly was carried by what brand of, uh, what brand of organism? Mosquitoes. Also, polio. Polio, which caused the legs to go ahead and start to shut down. Movement was very hard. Also, herpes. So none of these disorders or diseases are a good thing. Some of them have extremely, extremely detrimental effects on the human body. Some of the big ones include AIDS, hepatitis, uh, chickenpox, I guess it could cause shingles, but smallpox, that's a huge one. West Nile, H1N1, polio, all of these are not something you'd want to ever come in contact with. So the virus structure. As you can see, viruses have a very unique structure that kind of sets them apart from others. So there's a center core of DNA surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid. So the capsid would be right here, which goes ahead and contains the DNA. Now we have a wide variety of different types of viruses as well as structures. For example, this guy right here looks more like a spider. Now these guys are more or less giant needles. So what they have is they have our head, or the capsid, the neck, the collar, the sheep, the tail fibers, and the base plate. So what they'll do is they'll go ahead and latch onto something with these tail fibers. And then inside here, we have a needle. So the needle will go ahead and inject the DNA into the host cell, which causes some serious, serious damage. Meanwhile, on the other side, this virus over here is lacking the movement that we have from this virus. However, this is a free-floating virus, and what it will do is, if anything comes in contact with any of these spikes, all these spikes are needles. If it comes in contact with that, boom, instantly it's going to go ahead and inject the DNA into the host cell and start to wreak all kinds of havoc. You know, the more you know. So viral reproduction. We have a wide variety of different cycles, but they can be broken down into two basic ones. We have the lytic cycle. So during the lytic cycle, the virus goes ahead and injects its nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, into the cell and takes over all activities. And we also have the lysogenic cycle. The lysogenic cycle coexists with the cell without destroying the host immediately. It still goes ahead and takes care of the host cell, but it takes its time doing it. It's very sneaky about it. So on the next couple of slides here, we're going to be showing you a diagram of each cycle and how they work. So the lytic cycle. What we have here is first off, the virus will go ahead and land on a host cell. What it does is it goes ahead and injects its DNA into the cell, which is right here. So it merges with the host cell's DNA. It then gradually goes ahead and starts to take over all cellular activity. And it goes ahead and says, hey, yeah, you know how you were going ahead and making red blood cells? Um, you don't need to do that anymore. Make more of me. We need more copies of me. So what they do is they make more and more and more copies of the virus until eventually the cell can't take it anymore. And the cell will actually burst, releasing thousands and thousands and thousands of these virus copies to go ahead and infect other cells. So that's why a virus can spread so quickly. Once it goes ahead and infects one cell, it's basically got anywhere between 100,000 to even more copies that can go infect more cells. That's how these things can go ahead and spread so quickly. Now the other type is the lysogenic cycle. So the lysogenic cycle starts off 
as the lytic cycle. Like we said before, right here, our uh, virus goes ahead, lands on the host cell. It injects its DNA, but instead of taking over the cell, like it did here, what it does is it goes ahead and merges. So it goes ahead and becomes one with the host DNA. So every time the host cell goes ahead and makes a copy of itself, it's making another copy of the virus. So it goes ahead and it bides its time, hiding itself in the copies of the new cells. Now this continues until eventually there is a signal that's sent or received by the virus. And once it sends this signal, every single cell that has this viral DNA inside it is going to all of a sudden immediately go through the lytic cycle all at once. So that's thousands of cells all going ahead and going through the lytic cycle. So it takes a bit longer for the cell to be destroyed, but the end game is still the same. So, go ahead and think about this for a sec. How do the lytic and lysogenic cycles make it hard to destroy some viruses? And how might it be possible, or what technology could be developed to defeat these viruses? I'm going to let you go ahead and think this one over to yourself here, while I go ahead and enjoy a little bit of this uh, delicious, delicious tea. Uh, still drinking that uh, peach honey white tea. Oh, man, it's fantastic. Ah, anyway, so think about different options that could be used to destroy these things. You can keep thinking it over, but we're going to go ahead and move on. So, RNA viruses. RNA viruses deal with the direction, uh, or more or less direct, the production of proteins by a host cell. Now there are very specific types of these, like the retrovirus. A retrovirus is a special type of virus that can make DNA. But once it makes this DNA, it can produce new RNA, and then in turn can make new proteins to produce new viruses. So this type of virus actually isn't as reliant on a host cell as the others, making it far more dangerous. And the most famous example of this is HIV, or AIDS which is a highly detrimental disease that goes ahead, breaks down your immune system, and basically makes it so something as easy as the common cold could kill you. It's really, really nasty. So that does it for viruses. Now let's talk about the other end of the spectrum here, which is bacteria. We're going to be talking about uh, primarily the different types of bacteria, the structures, the shapes you can find, and what they can be used for. Now what might surprise you is not all bacteria is bad, which we'll get to at the end of the slideshow here, but bear with me, follow along, and we'll get through it just fine. So prokaryotes, this is just a nice summary, Pro uh, prokaryotes, traditionally all prokaryotes were classified as something called monarins. Now monarins, this doesn't exist anymore, we're just classifying them under both bacteria and archaebacteria now, so we split the category. Also known as bacteria, which is plural, or bacterium, which is singular. Presently, the prokaryotes are divided into two kingdoms. Do you remember what they are? I'll just assume you do. So here's a nice little picture. We got our two types. We have our archaebacteria, and we have our eubacteria. So, archaebacteria it comes from the Greek word archaeo, which means ancient. This bacteria has been around for a long, long time, and they all live in harsh environments. So that's what makes them so unique. These things can survive in areas that no other organism could possibly live in. For example, underground thermal heat vents, or geysers, or even there are some that can be found living and thriving inside of frigid glaciers. You know, these things are truly astounding. The other type is our eubacteria. So eubacteria is the larger of the two kingdoms. They live almost everywhere. For example, some places you might find them. 
on cups, on your skin, on your clothing, on everything around you. And I know you're all addicted to these things. These cell phones, <laughs> oh man, it's a breeding ground for them, buddy. So these are vital for functions of life and industry. That's right, we have bacteria, a huge amount of bacteria that actually live inside of our bodies. Okay, it's not that weird. Without these things, we basically couldn't do anything. So they can be both helpful and harmful depending on which type you have. So facts about bacteria. Once again, they're found everywhere. Bacteria, it's everywhere. Get used to it. They are very small, much smaller than any other cell inside your body. Now this is partially in due to the fact that they are prokaryotic cells. They lack a nucleus, membrane-bound organelles, so as such, they can't get very complex. So they have no membrane structure, uh, structures or nuclei, making them prokaryotes, like I just said. And they're usually surrounded by a cell wall and a capsule for additional protection. So since they're so simple, they need all the protection they can get. They have a capsule, so a capsule, it's kind of like a shield that goes around them, and then they have another layer of protection outside of that. So think of it like layering up for going outside in the winter. You go ahead, you put on one coat, then you put on another coat outside of that. You're protecting yourself from the elements. So the general structure of a bacteria cell. What we got is we have our capsule on the outside. We have our cell wall, which is our next layer. Let me go ahead and pick something that isn't red so you can see this a little bit better. So we have our capsule. We have our plasma or cell membrane. So that has a three layer barrier. We have the cytoplasm, which is all this nice blue jelly like stuff in here. We have our ribosomes, which are responsible for making protein. We have plasmids. We have this glorious looking wad of chewed up gum or yarn that is our DNA. Bear with me, it's very hard to write the mouse. But on the outside, you'll notice they have some very unique structures that you don't normally see. We have these little tiny hairs that are called pili. Now what these pili do is they go ahead and can sense what's around it. They also can be used to stick it to certain surfaces. Now this fun little whip thing coming off the back is called a flagellum or flagella. It kind of acts like a little propeller that allows it to go ahead and move through its environment. And it's pretty fun to say. So talk with your partners again. What are one or two adaptations that bacteria have evolved to survive in an uncertain environment? So go ahead, take a little bit of time. Think about this one. I'm going to enjoy my tea. All right, so one or two adaptations that bacteria have evolved to survive in an uncertain environment. Think about the capsule, the cell wall, the pili, all of which go ahead and help the cell survive in an area that it might not be used to yet. So up next, bacteria are all classified according to their shape. The first type is the coccus or cocci which is the spherical form. It can be single cells, found in pairs, or in chains, or clusters. Some examples include streptococcus, which causes strep throat, and staphylococcus, which causes staph infections. So as you can see here, right below me, um, what we have is a wide variety of different spheres all combined into a cluster. So we have some that are in a cluster. Let's go with green. So we have some that are in a cluster here. We have some that are in a chain. They can also be in a pair or free floating by themselves. 
Okay, that might be the worst circle ever drawn of all time. But anyway, based off their shape, they're very sticky. They can stick to each other very easily. So that is our first type. The second type is known as bacillus or bacilli, which is the rod or bar shape. They are also single cells and can also be found in pairs or chains, but not clusters. So an example would be anthrax, bacillus anthracis, and also E. coli, both of which can make you incredibly sick. So if you go ahead and look down here, we've got our bacillus or bar shape. Easy way to remember that, bacillus and bar both start with bees. Bees, bees. So, as you can see here, they can be free-floating, attached as a pair, or can be attached in a chain. So the ends are very sticky, but the rest of it isn't. So anthrax is a poison to the body, and E. coli, it's kind of like, imagine the worst food poisoning you could ever have. And that's E. coli. E. coli is bacteria commonly found in fecal matter, or for lack of a better term, poop. So, continuing here, we also have the spirochetes, or the spiral type. Now, spirals can only exist as single cells. Some examples include syphilis and Lyme's disease. So as you can see here, they've got a very unique kind of spiral-like structure. Now, Lyme's disease in this area is very prevalent. I mean, there's no getting around that. So make sure you protect yourself when you go outside. Think like... Think like Pokemon, all right? I can't believe I'm going here with this, but just work with me. If you want to avoid ticks, avoid the tall grass. Use repellent. There we go. So just watch yourself out there, okay? So, the final type is spiral, which can only exist as a single cell. So, bacterial reproduction. They all reproduce asexually. Asexually, remember, meaning only one parent. And they usually reproduce through something called binary fission. So, under certain conditions, bacteria can reproduce incredibly quickly. A small colony can double in size in only about 20 minutes, if given the right conditions. You'll be doing an experiment later on this year, actually coming up relatively quickly, where you will see this. We'll actually be growing our own bacteria in a, in a matter of 72 hours, you will have a huge increase in the amount of bacteria that you have. Basically, you'll go from something you can't even see to something that takes up basically a whole petri dish. It's actually pretty cool. So binary fission. So fission means to split. Binary, we're talking about two. So we're going from one cell to two cells. Now, it is the most common type of asexual reproduction. It's where a single cell splits to form two daughter cells. So we have our original cell, and what it does is it goes ahead and pinches itself, basically, until it splits into two. Now, what you might not have known is bacteria can actually exchange DNA with others through the process of conjugation. Conjugation is the transfer of genes between two bacterial cells that are temporarily joined. So as you can see here, we have one bacterial cell, and we have another bacterial cell. And what we've got connecting the two of them is this little cord. Now this cord kind of goes ahead and allows information to be exchanged between the two. Now bacteria wants this. It wants variations in its gene pool. The more variations it has, the better its chance of survival. I mean, that's just how it works, which we'll talk about a lot more once we get to genetics, heredity, 
and evolution later on in the year. But by this process, it goes ahead and helps increase its survivability by transferring genes between another. So if you have a partner here, go ahead and talk to them. How might the exchange of, oh, we just kind of answered this. Well, that's awkward. But anyway, you get the idea. So endospores. So endospores are a thick covering around the DNA that allows the bacteria to remain dormant for long periods of time, if necessary, for many years. Some examples include anthrax, or bacillus anthracis, and tetanus. So if you go ahead and look at this bacteria here, see how we have this covering on the outside? So the bacteria is inside here, and then we have this covering that goes around it. Now what that does, basically, is it allows it to go into a state of suspended animation, where it doesn't have to worry about surviving, eating, reproducing, anything like that. It's going to stay that way until it finds itself in a set of conditions that allow it to reproduce, feed, etc. So think about tetanus. You primarily get tetanus from rusted metal, right? So on that, let's say you're working in a shed and there's a rusty nail sticking out. You don't see it. It's been there for many years. It's covered in rust and you accidentally step on it. All of a sudden, that bacteria was transferred from the rust on the nail to inside of you. Now, once it realizes that it's inside of you, that endospore will go away. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. Hey, I like this place. I can get used to this place. I'm gonna go ahead and set up shop here. So what it'll do is the endospore will leave and the bacteria will instantly go ahead and reactivate going ahead, spreading, reproducing, and ultimately causing a wide variety of disorders. Now, not all bacteria is out to get you. We actually have a huge amount of helpful bacteria that we use in industry and inside of our bodies. For example, inside of our intestines, we have bacteria that helps decompose food waste. So what this does is it allows the bacteria to go ahead and break down the food that we eat and extract helpful nutrients, which is extremely helpful. If we didn't have that, we'd be in some serious trouble. It can also produce vitamins and antibodies through the process of genetic engineering. So what they'll do is we know that bacteria reproduces very fast, right? So if you go ahead and look down here, what we've got is they'll go ahead and inject bacteria, the uh, not bacteria, they'll inject the vitamin or the antibody into an active germ cell. And what it will do is the germ cell will go ahead and reproduce very, very rapidly. And in the process, it's also making more copies of the antibiotic or the vitamin, which at that point we can go ahead and extract it from the bacterial cells or kill off the bacterial cells and keep the vitamins. And just like that, we have a huge variety or a huge number of vitamins and antibodies that we can gather rather quickly. Now, also, they decompose dead plants and animals. Go ahead and get rid of that there. Also, they can be used for industry and agriculture, as well as fixing bacteria, uh, fixing nitrogen for plants. Plants can't actually use, wait, well, dang on, I'm getting ahead of myself here. We'll talk about that on the next slide. But they can be used in industry and agriculture. So, for example, we use bacteria to go ahead and turn milk into yogurt and cheese. We also use it to go ahead and turn yeast into bread. Also, we use it to turn grapes and other fruit into wine. So bacteria can be incredibly helpful if you know how to use it. I'm not going to lie to you, that cow is kind of freaking me out. Alright, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Let's go on. So, talk with your partner again. Imagine what are one or two ways that helpful bacteria that lives on or in our bodies can become harmful. Go ahead, kick it around, see what you think. 
But in the meantime, we're going to go ahead and get through the last couple of slides here. So nitrogen fixing bacteria. Nitrogen fixing bacteria basically lives inside the roots of plants. What they do is it can be helpful in fixing nitrogen for plant use. The nitrogen in the soil, the plants can't actually use yet. So what the bacteria does is it goes ahead, takes in that nitrogen and converts it into a form that the plants can use. From there, the plants then use the nitrogen, which is essential for life, to go through its daily processes. An example of this is the rhizobium nodules found in the roots of soybeans. You see these little kind of uh, bulges there? Those are the rhizobium nodules that contain our bacteria, which help the plant go ahead and live through its day-to-day -day basis. Common bacterial diseases. So common bacterial diseases include, we talked about Lyme's disease, tetanus, strep throat, tuberculosis, and toxigenic E. coli all of which are pretty bad news. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of yet another video PowerPoint. And one step closer to finishing off, Unit 2, Classification. I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this fantastic little journey today. And until next time, I will see you in the next video. You all keep it classy.